So welcome to the workshop. We're really happy with such great attendance on expansion complexity and lifting theorems. Uh, really happy to have Arkadev, Professor Arkadev Chattopadhyaya here for the first talk. Um, I've known Arkadev for a long time. He got his PhD at McGill and I heard of him because he solved the problem that I was really interested in, which is to prove a lower bound for set disjointness in the multi-party number on forehead model, um, which was a really great result. Uh, so I got to know him a long time ago from that, and then he did a postdoc in Toronto, and he's been at TFIR for five years? Seven, seven, seven years. years since then. He's a number of remarkable results in communication complexity and circuit complexity, uh, and he's also a great speaker, so without further ado. Uh, thank you, Tony, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, so my idea for asking the organizers to uh, organize a workshop on extension complexity and lifting theorem was to learn about extension complexity and lifting theorem. Because I really don't know anything about it, uh, about extension complexity. And their gift back to me was that I am the first speaker. So <laughs> you'll have to bear with me uh, with whatever little I know. Uh, I only know a little bit about lifting theorems. Uh, thanks to a bunch of very smart students that I had. But yeah, I mean, most of this is classical stuff. A lot of stuff has happened. and. Uh, I mean, I think uh, several speakers will follow me up and uh, tell you more about them, uh, more about those, those, uh, those very interesting uh, work. Uh, so I will assume some familiarity with communication complexity. Okay? So uh, I will quickly recall, so here's uh, Alice and Bob. Oh, by the way, uh, the thing that I'm going to, since there is no uh, space for writing on the whiteboard, this is based on joint work with uh, Mihal Kautsky, Bruno Lov, and Shagnik Mukhopadhyay. Uh, also, a very recent work. Uh, with uh, Yuval Filmus, Sajin Korot, Ormeyer, and Tony. So we will see two styles of lifting theorems. But first, let me uh, talk about the basic setup. So there's Alice. And she gets x, Bob gets y, as you all know. And then they start communicating according to some predetermined protocol. They have to compute some function f, which could be a partial function or, a, or, or even a search problem. Okay. But I will assume it to be function for now. And and I will assume that, you know, for simplicity, let's just assume that they talk one a, a bit at a time. So there, there are rounds in each round. The protocol specifies who's to talk. And if Alice is to talk, Alice sends one bit based on what she sees on her side. So it's some arbitrary function. Okay? And this is something that you, all of you know. Okay? So at the end of the rth round, they output the answer. Okay? So the protocol, which I will call pi, pi of xy, should be exactly equal to f of xy. This is the goal. OK? And now there's another model, which is even more elementary, in which case you have some input, which I will call uh, z. So this is the first bit of z, and this is the nth bit of z. And you have some other function, let's say h of uh, 0, 1 to the And in this model, which is the query model, uh, you have a decision tree. So it's, a pro it, it's, it's an, some algorithm which queries a particular bit of z. At the root, maybe it queries the z1. Then it queries the second. Uh, if this is 0, this, it goes this way. And then maybe it queries the 17th bit. And so on. 
and then at the leaves, they are labeled either 0 or 1, or whatever the range of the function is, because this may be also, again, a partial function or a search problem. And so for every possible input, Alice, uh, th this, this uh, query algorithm, there is a fixed path, because I'm assuming deterministic, there's a fixed path that gets uh, traveled, querying each bit at a time, and you reach a leaf, and then you output whatever the leaf has labeled, right? So this looks like a really, really uh, simple model where, you know, there is no Alice, no Bob. And the algorithm doesn't get to see uh, any input bit. For every bit that it wants to see, it has to pay a cost of uh, one unit, OK? Uh, so, so that's the setup. And what we are going to do today, and what lifting theorems, the kind of lift, lifting theorems that we will talk about, is that sort of a very interesting connection between, you know, hardness. If a function is hard in this model, it mean, meaning that you have to, in the worst case, query a lot of bits before you can give the answer, then a associated or related function becomes hard in this very different looking model called communication model. Okay? This is the goal of lifting theorem. So here's an example. which all of you know. Now here, of course, you, you're given two sets, x and y. And what you have to output is one if and only if, you know, x intersection y is the empty set. OK? So you can think of them as the characteristic vector of two sets. And you want to find out if the two sets are disjoint. Only then you want to output one. Here, on the other hand, in the query model, let's look at this function or. Okay, very simple function. Yeah? So this uh, or of z is equal to 1 if and only if there exists an i such that zi is equal to 1. Okay? <clears throat> now, this is something, of course, you have you know, seen many times. But if you think about it, somehow the hardness of set disjoint, it's a very hard function in the communication complexity model, the hardness is associated with this fact that what can Alice and Bob do? Because, you know, they've got this, Alice has got x and Bob has got y. Now, what they want to find out is, basically, if there is an xi and yi such that xi, yi, if there is an i such that xi and yi are both 1, right? So, in some sense, the function can be rewritten as you sort of do first bitwise and of x and y, you get an n-bit string, and then you want to find out whether there is a, a 1 in that n-bit string. So although Alice has full access to x and Bob has full access to y, the relevant information seems to be in the string, if I may call it z, which is equal to the bitwise, this is the bitwise and of x and y, right? And just looking at x and y, they have very little information about this z. Okay? If xi is 0, then of course, at that position, xi and yi cannot be uh, 1, but then Bob doesn't know that. Right? So, the, so the informa they, they seem to be almost um, information-wise as much blinded as a query algorithm is when the query algorithm doesn't get any access to z. Right? So they have to find out for each bit, and it seems that to find out for each bit, Alice has to tell Bob, look, I've got here a 1. What have you got there? Okay. So this is, of course, a very, very uh, a vague idea, because uh, we will see a counterexample very soon about this, that this, of course, doesn't happen always. Okay. This happens uh, only in some special situations. Turns out for set disjointness, this can be formalized, and that's the formal proof uh, that, indeed, because the query complexity of or, so we know that and this is the notation I will use, the query complexity of or, this is deterministic decision tree, query complexity of or is equal to n, this is of course uh, informal, yeah, this implies that the uh, 
is also equal to omega n. Okay? And lifting theorems would try to make this formal. Okay. So, and in, let me also remind you that in communication complexity, many functions that we deal with, like said disjointness, inner product, all of these can be thought of as first Alice and Bob have to do a bitwise certain operation and then they have to compute some other function. So, for example, uh, you know, said disjointness is, can be written as or of and or nor of and, right? Inner product can be written as x or of and, and so on. I'm just reminding you. If you think about it, most commonly used functions have this kind of composition property. And it's something to do with the uh, incompatibility of the outer function and the inner function that makes the problem almost as hard as the decision tree version for the outer function. Okay? But so what I'm trying to say is that one may expect that the decision tree complexity reflects in the communication complexity. And another reason why you should think of that this is very natural is suppose in general I were to give you some function capital F which is F composed with, so this is a general setup, F composed with G, okay? And one natural communication strategy for computing F would be to look at the decision tree of F, okay? So F is some function from Z to 0, 1, and G is some gadget, okay? So each bit of Z is being hidden, yeah, is being distributed or encoded by G. Okay? So, a natural communication strategy for, for, for capital F is to look at the decision tree uh, protocol for small f and whenever, and this was something Tony was saying yesterday, whenever, you know, say here, I want to find out what is Z1, well, I can't find out what is Z1, for that I need to do the first instance of G x1 y1. If I evaluate that, then I get Z1. Okay? And I will employ the best communication protocol that I have for G, okay? Eva and use that to evaluate Z1, and then I know Z1, and Alice and Bob would now at this point both know Z1, and maybe Z1, maybe this evaluation gives me 1, so I go to the right side, and now this was maybe Z5, now I evaluate G X5 Y5, yeah, so this is the fifth block, and the of x and y, and then this will give me z5, and then again knowing that Alice and Bob can continue with simulating this decision tree, okay? And if you do that, then this strategy shows that the deterministic communication complexity of f is at most the decision tree complexity of small f times the communication complexity of g, okay? The question is, is this optimal? The set disjoinness example or inner product suggests, well, yeah, this probably is optimal, but this is not always the case. Here are two examples that I would like to come back, sort of counter examples that I would like to come back uh, later also at the end of the talk, uh, because this will lead us to a very interesting subject, I think. So, trivial pathological looking example, suppose I take XOR of XOR, okay? Now XOR, which is the parity function, of course has very large deterministic communication, uh, query complexity, until and unless you know all the bits, you have no idea about XOR. So you have to query everything and get, and only then would you be able to know the answer, right? And uh, the, so, you know, if I look at XOR of XOR, I would expect that the, that the communication complex, if such a theorem was true always, then I would have expected that the deterministic communication complexity of this function would have been, you know, very large. But of course, this is not true because XOR of XOR squishes into XOR, and so Alice can just take the XOR of her bits and send it over in one bit to Bob, and then Bob can just evaluate the answer. 
So this looks like a pathological example. So some, some care has to go into this. Okay? You can't, of course, say that this is always true. Okay? This looks like, okay, this can be easily avoided. So now, one important thing is we would also like to assume, as I said, my function, the outer function f, I want to assume as little about it as possible. For instance, it may not be a, a, a total function. It could be a partial function. In fact, the lifting theorems are often used in the context when the outer function is a partial function or a search problem. So here's another example. Suppose, you know, I, I, I say that f is a function which is the input to f, sorry, input of f. So my promise is the following. Uh, either every zi is equal to 0 or there exists a unique i such that zi equals 1. So I have an n bit string and I'm giving you the promise that either all of them is 0 or there's exactly 1. The Hamming weight is 1 and you have to distinguish these two cases. Now if you go to the query model, this is the hard instance of the OR function, right? This is, this is the one on which you will spend most of your time because you will keep querying for a one, you will never get it until the adversary, had, when he has exhausted you, he will show you the one or he may not show you the one, right? So this is very hard, this takes n bits, okay? So this is going to be the, the, the communication complexity, so this is let's say promise star. the decision tree complexity of promised R is still omega n, right? Now let's look at f, which is promised R of equality. Now equality, uh, I, I, equality is just another important function, equality is and of XOR. Okay. Uh, so equality is a classical example of a hard function in deterministic communication complexity. And what you would like to think that this function, um, because you have composed it with a hard function here, this function should have very large communication complexity. In particular, suppose I had uh, n instances, so let me write it here, this is n instances of equality, and this is m, each equality string is an m bit string. This, maybe I should write it larger, right? So you would, you, you, you would think that this should take n times m bits of communication, because this, by the naive protocol, whenever you would like to evaluate over here, you have to spend m bits, and I showed you, I convinced you that this, the decision tree complexity of the promised or is, 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 is very large, right? But it turns out, and it's a, it's a cute exercise to, to show that, you know, the, the, the communication complexity of this F, no matter how large is N, is actually order M. Okay, because of this promise. Okay, so, yeah. When you, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. I mean, when, it's promise in the sense that you can assume that they are free to answer. Whenever the promise is broken, they can answer anything, yeah. Just as in this case, I gave you the promise. If the ZIs were different, uh, you could answer anything, right? But despite that, despite knowing that, it was the hardest possible thing. So you would have, you could have hoped this. Now, this requires a bit more thought. It, it's not, uh, it's not hard. Uh, I mean, you know. Okay, I'll leave it with a curious, uh, interesting exercise. So the point is, you know, what I'm trying to say is that not every gadget is, is, is useful in rendering the communication model to the query model. Yeah? Meaning, or, or you have to be very careful about this. Okay? So you can't, you can't hope that, you know, in every situation this would happen. Okay? And it's, it's, this particular one, I would like you to work it out because you will see that the, that the fact that the communication uh, sort of model has this side information, 
Yeah, in the sense that okay, there's some co I mean there's correlation. Things are correlated. Okay, I mean it is not independent. And Alice and Bob are able to see all of X and all of Y. That side information can be used in situations to bypass following the naive following the naive algorithm. So now let me try to say the main theorems. So in some sense, these theorems are rather delicate about, I mean, it's amazing that they work. When they work, that they work so very generally. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the theorems will show, yeah, okay, delicate in the sense, okay, one of the theorems will show that if you picked a large enough random gadget, this will work. Okay, so regardless of what the outer function is. Okay, so I want to give you uh, two theorems, as I said, from these two works. One, uh, this uh, will generalize a series of works, first by Raz and McKenzie back in uh, early 90s, and then Tony with uh, Mika Gus and Tom Watson's, yes. So for this promised or uh, composed with this equality, yes. if uh, m is equal to 1, yes. then in that case this just becomes this set disjointness uh, problem. Right? No. No? Equality is an XOR, and that makes a huge difference. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Said disjoinness was an AND. Right. So what I was saying was that this is generalization of Raz and McKenzie. And I think Raz and McKenzie were the first ones to prove a lifting theorem of the kind uh, that we are, that we'll talk about. But uh, I mean, as a, uh, as a disclaimer, I want to say that there are many instances of lifting theorems. It depends on what you are lifting to what. Okay. So there are lifting theorems which, which are more algebraic in nature. A very important example of this is Sherstov's lifting theorem, independently also discovered by Xi and Zhu, where he showed that you know a different measure of uh, uh, one-party functions like approximate degree can be lifted into randomized communication complexity. Okay, we are not talking about such lifting theorems. The lifting theorems that we will talk about are when you want to lift lift specifically the decision tree complexity measure. So in order to state our lifting theorem, I want to tell you about two other notions that will be useful, uh, one of which you might have already seen. So how do you prove lower bounds against communication protocols? The basic building blocks, I'm sure all of you know, uh, of a communication protocol is that are, are, are rectangles. So in other words, if I have a communication protocol of cost C, then the communication matrix, which is this matrix, uh, one associated with all possible inputs of Alice, the other associated with all possible inputs of Bob, and this is a Boolean matrix, you know. So each entry here is the value of F. If this is X, this is Y, this is X, Y, right? So that's the communication matrix. And this communication matrix is broken into two to the C monochromatic submatrices by a communication protocol. A communication protocol just you know, takes a certain cut here. Uh, as Alice speaks, she divides her input onto two parts. Then Bob speaks. Bob divides his input onto two parts. And if you do this, you will see that it gets uh, broken up into chunks. And each of this chunk, at the end, at the leaf, each leaf represents a submatrix, and these submatrix have to be monochromatic, because if I assume a deterministic protocol, then you know that, that there's no 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 possibility of error. So it basically breaks down this communication matrix into two to the C, at most two to the C monochromatic submatrices. Okay, and these submatrices are what I will call combinatorial rectangles, and one way to prove lower bound against uh, communication complexity. Uh, communication protocols is to say, well, you're going to break it down into two to the C uh, monochromatic submatrices, then at least one of them, the average size of that, such a submatrix is two to the minus C, the fractional size, right? And you, you, if you show that there cannot be a monochromatic rectangle 
of size, fractional size to the minus c, then you are done, right? Then, then, then you cannot have c bit supernova. So now I'm going to talk about a property of, uh, of this. So we are in this situation, f is f composed with g, and I'm going to talk a property of this gadget g, because I want to prove a lifting theorem, meaning, you know, some property of g will ensure that no matter what f is, the decision sees the goal is to say, what property of g ensures that the naive protocol is a simple protocol, right? So DCC of f is equal to Yeah, we saw that this is all not always true, right? I gave you two examples. What we want to find out is what is that a sufficient property of G that ensures that this holds, okay? And more generally, uh, since I don't have time, let me also say the same thing should hold for randomized communication. So there's a difference between epsilon and epsilon prime. This is uh, technical stuff. Uh, so yeah, so you want these things to be true, OK? So it's all about G. There is, because it's G is somehow encoding this in such a way that, as I said, even though you have access to massive amounts of side, side information, even under promises of weird uh, correlations, yeah, it doesn't matter. G is so hard that. Alice and Bob are basically forced to follow this naive strategy of querying bit by bit, okay? So we want to find out an interesting uh, properties of G that, that is sufficient for, for such purposes, okay? So um, in order to talk about those properties of G, I will have to talk about these properties about rectangles. So I want to talk about two things. Uh, one is, as the title of my talk said, one is hitting distributions. They seem quite different, and the other is discrepancy. Okay? So, now, what hitting distribution says is that, you know, so I look at G, I look at all the monochromatic rectangles of G. Now, there are two kinds of monochromatic rectangles of G. Yeah. So uh, my question is in the composition G, like uh, the examples you gave G is a very low arity function, right? Maybe just on one bit. The, low, the, the, the lower the better for applications. Yes, that's true. And do we also assume that, uh, so each copy of G would act on like disjoint set of various? Yes, 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 this is block composition. Yeah, this notation. Somehow traditionally this was, so this block, there's no overlap. Yeah, that's very important. Okay, so there are, there, I mean, I will talk about a C monochromatic rectangle of G. This should be clear, C is some, C is in zero, 1, right? So it's either zero monochromatic rectangles of G or one monochromatic rectangles of G. Now. I want to say that not only G is hard in the sense that it has no small monochromatic rectangles, but the, so that's true of a random function. A random function will not have large monochromatic rectangles, okay? But now I want to say something which is, which is not true of a random function. It's, okay, at, at one point, in, in one sense it has no large monochromatic rectangles, that's like a random function, but, you know, there's, at the same time, it has, it has not two large monochromatic rectangles, it has somewhat large monochromatic rectangles, and these somewhat large monochromatic rectangles are sort of nicely distributed. And what do I mean by that? Formally, I have a distribution for each C, a, a, a hitting distribution uh, that I will say sigma C, which samples, okay, which samples a C monochromatic rectangle at random, so this is some distribution, okay. And under this sampling, if you give me, 
in this matrix any large rectangle, this is some large rectangle, not necessarily monochromatic of course, it is so some large rectangle, the probability when you sample according to sigma c, a c monochromatic rectangle, this rectangle is r, r intersects with your sampled rectangle, uh, let us say u cross v, yeah, this is very small, sorry, intersects, oh this is large, right, okay. So what do I mean by large? So there are two parameters here, the probability must be, the probability of not intersecting is very small like delta and the largeness of R, the size of R, so R is greater than or equal to 2 to the minus h large. So I am always talking about fractional, uh, fractional largeness, okay. So I want to have these distributions. So no matter which rectangle you give me, if I, I, I have two distributions, sigma c, that is sigma 0 and sigma 1, you want to hit with a zero monochromatic rectangle, I will sample from sigma 0 and then, you know, I will, um, if, if I sample such a rectangle, u cross v, according to my distribution sigma 0, then very likely I am going to hit this, your given rectangle, okay. And I can do that also with sigma 1. In particular, therefore, that means that your large rectangle is not monochromatic because I have been able to hit it with non-zero probability, with very large probability, both by a zero monochromatic rectangle and a one monochromatic rectangle. So in particular, your, your rectangle is not, it cannot be monochromatic. The, the, the simple condition that we talked about before, but you see, you need to have these things. These are not satisfied by a random gadget. It's a very delicate distribution, okay? So this I will call, if G has this property, so then, Yes. No, R has to be large enough. Well, U cross V is some distribution that I, I mean, I mean, U cross V lies in the support of my distribution, and I'm sampling according to that. I mean, who knows what it, what it is? For all R, for all R. Sorry, for all R. Yeah, U cross V is being sampled. U cross V is being sampled according to sigma c. U V is sampled according to sigma c. So when this happens, I say that G, so this is said G has the delta H property, okay. Seems like barely I will have the time to state the two theorems. Okay, so the first theorem is the following that, okay, I am again stating this informally because, yeah, you can check out the paper and look at it more carefully. So assume that, uh, so you are looking at F n composed with G B, yeah, so the, so the, so the block size of G is B bits and you have n instances of uh, G and you are creating this function and let us assume that 1 is less than, okay, this is an important Epsilon is some, some fixed uh, number between 0 and 1 and G has the hitting delta H hitting property, then I can show okay, I am intentionally writing it in this way because this will suggest how the proof goes. So, yeah, so what this means is, if you give me a communication protocol of this much cost for this protocol, then I will be able to extract a decision tree. So that's how the proof goes. You've given me an arbitrary protocol which is working in weird ways. We have no idea. But using the fact that G has this hitting distributions, I will be able to extract a decision tree for F with cost this much. And the important thing is, you know, this cost is being, is being slashed by this, this H. Yesterday you had a question about why should this saving uh, take place. Well, the intuition is very clear. Why should the saving happen? Yeah, because 
G is H hard. Okay, so until and unless you have communicated sort of H bits. Okay, so so you know you have here the inputs of Alice and Bob. Yeah. Now this, I mean, in order to so you 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 are evaluating G on each of these blocks, right? And this uh, the the individual instance of G is you should assume it's h hard you require this shows clearly that this heating distribution a trivial corollary of the heating distribution is that the communication complexity of g is h okay so until and unless you spend h bits on a focused coordinate you you know nothing about it this is something you have to prove but i'm saying this is the intuition right so every h bits worth of communication you are revealing perhaps too much about one bit. At that point, aha, uh -huh, you know, the one of the one of the coordinates has become very clear, right? And so on average, you know, this is happening. Okay, so this is this is the, the, the intuition to expect this is very clear. Okay, but you have to formalize this. Okay, so that's that's theorem one. And uh, Yes, yes, for all epsilon, yeah, and delta we assume is less than 1 over 100. Whenever delta is 1 over 100, this will work. For all epsilon in, epsilon is any, any parameter. So, in principle, you could, uh, for example, depend on n? No, epsilon does not depend on n. Oh, epsilon in principle could... Uh, so epsilon is between let's say now for now epsilon is a fixed number between 0 and 1 and whenever delta is less than 1 over 100 this inequality is satisfied okay so that's the first theorem uh, the second theorem is yes so, if g was chosen to be a random function, right. the thing that's unclear is if whether a random function satisfies the heating distribution. No, it's uh, the random function will not, will satisfy. not satisfy. Okay. Yeah, okay. you can prove that a random function with high probability will not satisfy. This theorem does not imply that. No, for a random function, no. And now I'm going to state the theorem with Tony and others where the, where we will be able to show that a random function works. The only, the, okay, let me state the other theorem and then I'll say the 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 way these things compare for which this works. Uh, there are many uh, examples, uh, although a random function doesn't satisfy it, but the examples that, but many of the cardinal problems in communication complexity in this regard do not behave like random function. For example, the index indexing function, the inner product function, the gap hamming problem, all of these would satisfy this, okay? And so, you know, uh, okay, let me first say, state the theorem for the other thing. So what is discrepancy? Okay, I mean, if you have taken a course in communication complexity, you have surely seen this, but let me still uh, state it again, okay? Uh, discrepancy is, so here so far, uh, discrepancy in some sense will seem like an overkill, okay? But uh, it's very powerful. So if you have a communication protocol, it basically, uh, we all know, it partitions the communication matrix into two to the C, uh, mo completely monochromatic rectangles, right? Now, it turns out, now suppose I say that I have forget that not only my function is hard in the sense that not only does it not have non large monochromatic rectangles, if your rectangle is slightly large, it has very small discrepancy, meaning, you know, if, if you think of it as being points are being colored by two colors, zero and one, the coloring has very small discrepancy, okay? in the sense that they're roughly balanced. Either your, your, your rectangle is extremely small or they're roughly balanced, okay? So uh, formally, you would want to say that the discrepancy of a rectangle R uh, for a function F is exactly equal to the probability
Is this clear? So, so you're looking at, yeah, so x, y is chosen under the uniform distribution. So, for now in this talk, I will only deal with the uniform distribution. Okay, so you sample, so basically you want, you, you, you're given some rectangle, okay, and you randomly choose an xy, and what's the probability, so it's basically, you know, the, the probability mass of the ones inside this, minus the probability mass of the zeros inside this, the difference of these two probability masses, it's a very natural way to measure, you know, if you had a monochromatic rectangle, then this discrepancy would just be the probability mass of this rectangle. Right? Because, yeah, everything is one, colored the same way. And now you are looking at the difference of these two masses, okay? And if they had perfect uh, balanced coloring, then this would become zero, right? So the smaller this difference is, the less biased this rectangle uh, is, and therefore this is being even farther from being monochromatic, okay? So it turns out that this is a very powerful quantity. If you have worked on extractors, this, is, this, may, this, may, uh, this may remind you of an, of an extractor-like property uh, because I'm using that word because I talked about hitting distributions there. This is uh, somewhat similar to an extractor. But when you have this very powerful property, then you can in fact show that not only, so maybe we should say G here because we are talking about G. Uh, yeah. So, so not only is G hard for deterministic protocols, it's even hard for randomized protocols, okay? And our theorem two is now saying, and, and oh, uh, the important remark is, if you choose a random function G on B bits, so it's, it's a fact that, you know, for a random G, the discrepancy, sorry, this is discrepancy of a rectangle and the discrepancy is the maximization of this quantity over all possible rectangles, okay? So discrepancy of, discrepancy of G is maximize the same quantity R over, over all possible rectangles. Now, for a random G, discrepancy of G is extremely small, is, is like about two to the minus I'm assuming G is over B bits, okay? So for a random G is extremely small, exponentially small, okay? That's the nice thing. So most Gs will have this property that will have a small uh, discrepancy. And the theorem two with, with uh, Yuval, Sajin, Orr, and Tony is the following result. Again, uh, informally, because I think I'm running out of time, is that same setup, now F is Fn of GB, okay? And let's say the discrepancy of G is, 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 is at most 2 to the minus eta B for some constant eta, okay? And B, is at least c times log n, where c is some constant that depends on eta, okay? Then we can say two things. Okay, so we, make, we made a stronger assumption and we are able to prove much stronger things, which is that not only now uh, the, the, the deterministic query hardness lifts to the hardness for deterministic protocols, but also as you can expect the randomized hardness lifts, the randomized decision tree hardness lifts to the randomized communication hardness, okay? So the advantage of this theorem is that as I said, is that it applies to, yeah, random gadgets G, and you also get a randomized lower bound, right? 
such a randomized lower bound we don't know how to obtain using heating distribution property okay or any 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 let's say uh, natural generalization of heating distribution property okay sorry in place of b yes 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 because the communication complexity of of g would be about log 1 over discrepancy of g okay so let me now just try to say a few uh, very uh, uh, brief things about how the proofs go okay uh, so the point is in each of this in both these theorems what you would start with is some arbitrary communication protocol i will stick for now with the deterministic protocol okay so you are given some deterministic protocol and you want to extract a decision tree out of this deterministic protocol with absolutely no idea how the internals of the protocol is working right but if you think about a protocol a protocol itself is also a tree right you have alice who talks then you have bob and then again alice and so on right and here the leaves represent as i said rectangles okay i'm talking about deterministic protocols okay now the point is alice of course is no longer in this protocol querying one bit she's computing an arbitrary function on his on her side and so is bob right and we want to extract from here another decision tree this is some sort of a tree and we want to extract another decision tree where you will be for will be just querying uh, one bit at a time so the idea is so I, I i want to construct this decision tree and the decision tree what is the input the input is some z in 0 1 to the n right so the point is the general strategy would be to delay querying a bit okay there will be some events that will trigger me to f uh, in the query pro in the in the query uh, protocol to, to 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 make a query and when does that happen at the beginning things are nice because you know the protocol has not said anything so you know all possible inputs for now if you were just watching the transcript of this protocol how which path it is executing in the protocol tree at the very beginning it could be you know nothing you, it could be the whole set of inputs right then you know alice computes some function and maybe you know this is one so you go down this path when you go down this path some information about alice's side is leaked right and if alice has revealed too much information about a particular bit then that's a cause of alarm because you know alice's input might start looking like fixed getting fixed in that particular coordinate right so the idea is that you want to sort of keep a measure about each coordinate okay and as long as it's some sort of a measure complexity measure and as long as that measure is large you want to say well that bit that particular coordinate is far from being revealed okay in the two theorems we use two different measures and when that measure is low on a particular coordinate then you will make a query and if you make a query again the intuition is 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 clear why did the measure go why did the measure becomes low on that particular coordinate because alice and bob chose to communicate something specific about that coordinate if they have done so then you then the, then the natural expectation is well they've only communicated c bits and most of these c bits were talking about this coordinate then the other coordinates if once i query about this and project myself onto the other coordinates very little must be known about these other coordinates each time i make a query i must while alice and bob chose to make the, this particular coordinate i'm saying it in a very vague way uh, alice and bob chose to uh, reveal a lot about this coordinate you know so this coordinate became very very f fixed looking like the other coordinates remained unfixed so when i project i should gain back something this is the this is the rough idea okay and in the case of uh, uh, the second theorem this measure is about uh, this measure 
uh, that that captures this this intuition is the following. It's uh, it, it's a min entropy based measure. So what you want to say is, if you have two random variables x and y, right? Um, or in fact, just let's first talk about uh, uh, one random variable. You have a random variable x, and uh, so x is formed of x1 to uh, xn, right? Each xi, let's say, is in 0, 1 to the b. Yeah? So, we want to talk about the density of x. Now, what is the density of x? The density of x, if it is, it is equal to, let's say, gamma, then what I want is that for all subsets of n, right? So this is the sum subset of coordinates that I chose to pick. Yeah, the min entropy of x projected down to that sub those those those, those set of sub uh, those set of coordinates. Right? This is just a projection of x. Right? That well, if things were perfect, this min entropy would be equal to i times the cardinality of i times b that's the maximum maximum possible entropy that you could have well you wouldn't have that but you would have that at least gamma times the size of i times b so i times b is the maximum possible min entropy because you are you know you're yeah you're over b bits there are i coordinates but you want to have at least a certain fraction of that and this is true for every possible subset i so then i say that the density of the random variable x is X is gamma. So yes. Why isn't X is just uniformly distributed? Because you are just. No, X is not uniformly distributed. X is a random variable. I have not assumed that X is uniformly distributed or anything. X is not uniformly distributed. Okay. And similarly, I could define Y arbitrarily distributed, but the point is X and Y are independent because I am in a rectangle. Okay. So, so I could define that, and at each roughly, very, very roughly, at each node of the protocol tree, the invariant that I, I want to keep an invariant that will preserve this, this uncertainty about the coordinates is that the min entropy of both x and y, uh, sorry, the density of both x and y measured in terms of min entropy is large, okay? These two properties, discrepancy and the delta h property, mm -hmm. uh, discrepancy is strictly stronger than the delta h property, they're, they're not comparable. They are incomparable. One doesn't imply the other. I was confused because you said like we have a stronger assumption here. They are be able to prove a stronger result, but it's not strictly a stronger assumption. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. It's not a stronger result in the sense that okay, we can prove the same result here, but we can prove additionally uh, a result about randomized lifting. I, I said it's stronger in that sense. Yeah, but the properties seem incomparable. Why is it uh, the case like, like you said a random function has high discrepancy, right? Has small discrepancy? Yeah, small discrepancy. Just uh, no, but then why does that kind of not seem to imply like maybe with the, like a, for a weak uh, like parameters delta h that it, it it should have delta h property? Like there it depends on what I set delta to be, right? Uh, you want the the rectangles uh, you know to be to be well spread out the monochromatic rectangles, right? And if you're given a sort of a large rectangle, yeah. Uh, then, if you think about it, if you if your rectangle, the monochromatic rectangles are not too large in size, not sufficiently large in size, then you have no chance of catching a, a largish rectangle. Okay, for in order to have this distributional thing, you, you if you think you will see that you need to have rectangles of a sufficiently large size, and a random and a random G does not permit that. So that is why you can't have these things nicely spread out. 